Yes, in the conference business, which I'm in, we call this a mantle. Um, and it's not desirable generally. We try to avoid it, but, uh, but obviously we, we, it, we balance it out uh, as much as we can. Um, so we're talking about investment strategies for world-changing tech. So we have to keep both those two things in mind. World-changing tech, how to make it happen, but also how to, for investors to benefit while making it happen. Um, and I, I think maybe we will, will, will learn that some investors are worried that that might not be happening enough. Uh, in fact, uh, since Steffi did a nice job introducing these two great guys, I'm not even going to bother. Let's start with Yaron and talk a little bit. Yaron's based in Berlin. Hey, Raman, is it a $500 million fund? Is that right? Slightly bigger. Slightly bigger. Um, but you, you, worry, you worry about this. So talk about what you worry about. So one of, I, I think one of our concerns as an industry is that we are closing the innovation gap. Uh, innovation always moves in the same fashion. There is basic research, then that basic research uh, translates into applied research, which then translates into companies that benefit all of us. And this is a, a, a trend or a, a phenomenon that has been ongoing since we started innovating, since we uh, discovered fire. Uh, and, the, and the problem is that when you close this innovation gap, when you've used all the basic research and all the applied research that has been uh, uh, created, you will not be able to innovate more. What is the next wave after cell phones, after miniaturization of electronics? Where, does it, where do we go next? And we as investors have a role in making sure that that... Uh, research that applied innovation also takes place in order to uh, uh, in order to create a new gap and the risk is that since we are short-term profit oriented you know venture capital funds are raised for 10 years usually uh, how do we bridge that how do we make sure that we make money uh, uh, fulfill the job that that our investors gave us uh, money for while at the same time creating a a uh, further gap that would let us innovate for the next 10 or 20 or 100 years. Okay, so Deep, you don't have any problem with access to money at the moment, anyway. Um, you can so, say that. What? You can say that. You, you got a lot of it. Um, in, and you pretty much are running the Vision Fund North America. That's your uh, job. I, I have several other partners. Yeah, but you're a big together. part of that. So um, when you look, okay, money is not the issue, at least let's just posit that. Are you confident that the venture capital ecosystem that SoftBank has so dramatically influenced and prodded is sufficiently identifying truly world-changing tech to get us beyond the era you know, that was really created by Steve Jobs in 2007? Absolutely. And I think we just have to look at the history and what gets invested in, in order to you know, take, take my answer and amplify it further. 50 years ago, when the TV revolution came up, you know, it took 30 years before every household had a TV. 2007, as, as you point out, pretty much around this time, I think it was January 17th, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 2007, when Steve Jobs went on stage and unveiled the iPhone, between then and today, 13 years later, I think there are more mobile devices in the world than human beings, which means some people have more than one. So that time gap has really become shorter. And as a result, more and more people have access to that technology. And what that does is it foments and fertilizes newer things to come about. Investors, you know, they follow whatever the innovation is going to happen. And as the pace of innovation has gone faster and faster, more capital has come into the market. So it's not an accident of history that the SoftBank Vision Fund came into being three years ago with a corpus of $100 billion. I think it came about because this is the right time to be deploying quite a bit of capital because there are four or five amazing innovation trends that are coming together all at once, and they will all require a lot of capital uh, to move further. So quickly summarize what some of those are that you see as the key things coming together and that are truly world-changing in your view. AIML, everyone talks about it, and we just heard you know, Joy's amazing version on how it could go bad if not harnessed correctly. 
uh, Internet of Things, IoT, computational biology slash genomics, which is what I talked about a couple of years ago here on stage. Uh, robotics, very much something we've talked about, but now it's in every factory and soon it will be in every home. And finally, things like blockchain and quantum computing, which are, you know, have been in the incubation stage for a while, but are really coming of age now. So is what you're saying that you're not really worried that we're lacking a framework of world-changing tech, it's just a matter of capitalizing on what's already been identified? Is that basically what you're saying? No, I think those are two important ingredients, but there's a third important ingredient. So the way I think about innovation ecosystems and eventually successful, i.e. capital generating ecosystems, it's a question of imagination, fertilization, and pollination. We talked about imagination, which is ideas, and there are lots of them coming about. Fertilization, which is capital, there's quite a bit of that too. But the most important one here is that of pollination. So anyone who's into gardening or growing things, which I am, you know that you can't just throw up like one or two trees and assume that they will fruit and flower every year. But if you have an orchard, things happen a lot more organically and with a faster virtue cycle. Similarly, when you have a sufficient critical mass of companies and capital, you know, by nature, innovative companies don't all succeed, right? Not everyone, there were probably 20 search engine companies and Google is the only one left today of any import. And that is the way change and innovation happens. But when those 19 search engines did not do well, a lot of them ended up at Google. So there are ways and means in which if the bee, you know, think of the workers or the innovators as the bees in this metaphor of pollination, they find one tree is not doing well, they can go to multiple other trees in the orchard. Similarly, cap venture capitalists or investors, when one of the investments fails, they have other investments that are doing okay. And so this ecosystem then self-propagates. So having that critical mass, Berlin is a great example of the latest critical mass. I think they started doing work in the technology area maybe about 15, 20 years ago, and now it's coming of age. Okay, you're actually in Berlin. Uh, now, uh, so, so I like I that skeptical make, look wait, on your face. One comment, because wait, for, what? It, it, I want to make one comment. Because Please, and I, the, the, and I was just going to say. At the end of the day, we're dishonest with ourselves. Can you all hear him pretty well? Is he okay? Yeah. All right, okay. At, at the, I think we're dishonest with ourselves, because at the end of the day, if you look at the amount of capital that is deployed into companies that are uh, using tech and not really innovating, uh, but rather uh, creating, uh, I don't know, a, a video, a short video clip sharing app uh, like TikTok. Uh, at the end of the day, most money that we're making is made from these companies, especially if you look at the European venture capital. Including you, by the way. You yes, told me this yourself. Uh, of right, course, yeah. of yeah. course. I, I'm, you know, I'm one of the culprits. Uh, at the end of the day, massive amounts of money go into applied technology, companies that are using technology in order to benefit the masses, in order to bring services to the masses. Very, very small amounts of money in comparison, especially in Europe, are going towards... Uh, inventing the new uh, paradigm in mobility, uh, flying cars or whatever, you know, things that, that advance us as a society a lot further than, uh, I'm sorry for knocking TikTok, but then TikTok. And, and, and this happens to be one of our companies, but that's what I, I think at the end of the day, we're a bit dishonest. You know, when <laughs> well, we, use when your, use your phrase of business model uh, innovation as yeah. opposed to, go, go, go that route. Because no, no. one of the points, by the way, of this whole session is to look at this question of whether Europe really has something wrong, that it's not creating fundamental business te technology, uh, world-changing tech. You know, we, we are hard-pressed to point to too many examples of that. So it is changing slowly, but generally, especially if we look at the last 10 years of European venture capital, it has been mostly about applied innovation. How do you bring better cleaning services to people's houses? How do you bring food to people's houses? It's nice, it made, it made me personally a lot of money and I'm very, very happy about it. But at the end of the day, this is not what's going to drive European innovation and this is not what's going to drive the European economy in the next 100 years. Well, it isn't even really tech either in no. many cases. Yeah, no. right. it, it gets called tech, but it's it is. applied technology. Yeah. It's basically using the internet in order to promote businesses. So have you got an idea on how that could or should change? Yeah, so I, I think one of the first things is the type of capital that we raise, because we are our master's servants. You know, we are, we are uh, uh, put on this earth in order to take money for 10 years and provide a very, very nice return on that money. 
And that's why pension funds give us money, that's why sovereign funds give us money, and this is the expectation. So we're, we, we are, uh, our, our, our task is very well defined. So the first thing to do is to change some of the sources of capital that we have and some of the, and some of the uh, KPIs that we as an industry have. Uh, if you look historically, we thought that this is the role of governments. We thought that a sovereign fund or a, a, a government-run venture capital fund is going to be um, uh, instrumental in, in driving these, uh, uh, in driving these, you know, this, these changes. That hasn't really panned out. It's the role of industry. It's the role of us as, 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 you know, as, as for-profit investors. Our outlook needs to be longer, and the outlook of the capital that goes into us needs to be longer for that. And that, that's exactly right. And, you know, in SoftBank's case, that's one of our unique value propositions to our founders and the companies we invest in is that we are long-term patient capital. Mm -hmm. If you look at our investment in Alibaba, 20 years later, we are still the largest investors. We, you know, we have a 28% stake in that company. That's worth, give or take, $130, $140 billion. But had we... Yeah, divested. that's not too many like that, actually, right? Yeah. No, right? Like, but, I no, mean, it's, none others ever. It's probably right. either the first or the second best venture investment ever made in the history of venture, like Tencent being the other one. And that's highly unusual, but that is in our DNA. We go in and we tell our founders, we're like, look, we will be with you as long as it takes and as long as you continue growing and you keep showing promise. We don't structure our fund so that it's a seven, eight, or 10-year fund. Our current fund is 12 plus two, and then we have mechanisms whereby we can go further than that. I mean, I don't want to be, get into the whole SoftBank thing in too much detail up here, because I know that's not supposed to be our mandate. But it is, hearing you say that, it, and just thinking about the obvious most recent debacle of WeWork, how... How do you cast that in the context of what you just said? Just explain that. Because it seems like WeWork was being pressed for an IPO. And, you know, obviously that process exposed all of these problems that had been more or less hidden from the world. And the company is borderline collapsing now. So explain how do you think of that in the context of what you just said. Yeah, and you know, the lessons of history can barely be spoken about in 30 second sound bites. So it's gonna be very difficult to unpack a naturally complex situation there. Let's just leave it at the fact that for any venture portfolio, and you know, in our vision fund, we have about 80 some investments, you're gonna get the bad news first. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what happens. You're, yeah. The companies that are not doing well, you're gonna get those news sooner. And the companies that are doing really well, you'll hear about them later. So yeah. we don't expect all 80 plus investments that we have to be amazing successes. We have already had eight IPOs, you know, Garden Health, that's changing the world of cancer detection. That's been an amazing outcome for us. Slack, which is changing workplace productivity, has been an amazing outcome for us. So we've had really good outcomes and then things like WeWork that haven't quite gone the way we planned, but we are still in it, we are involved, we are helping the company because we believe the idea at its core is very, very good and they had some governance and execution challenges that we are gonna help solve with the next set of management. And you think of yourself as sufficiently hedged through the variety of investments that you, know, you can really you know, absorb incidents like that and keep forging ahead with the arms and the other giant properties. Yeah, so typically you know, the hedge comes from diversification, both in terms of the kinds of companies you invest in, the stages of companies and the geographies. When it comes to geography, we are about 44% invested in the US, 34% in China and Asia, the remainder in Europe and other places. So that's you know, a very good diversified portfolio. In terms of the kinds of companies we invest in, on one hand, we have a portfolio of deep tech companies that go from you know, five to 15 years in terms of their impact. That's the part of the fund that I help lead. Then we have massive GDP swaths like transportation, like real estate, like financial services. Uh, that take a bunch of capital. And then finally, is something that we've been investing in for the last 40 years, which is technology, media, and telecom. Right. And we have that portfolio as well. So it is reasonably well diversified. Well, do you, do you and I, I want you to respond to what Yaron was saying specifically, though. I mean, do you consciously seek world-changing tech in, in, when you're, it, or, or is that just part of what you do? I mean, uh, it, it is hard to kind of understand SoftBank from a distance at the moment, I think for many of us. So yeah. 
But, but explain it. No, we absolutely do, right? And not just world-changing technologies, but also world-changing businesses that deploy technology in very meaningful ways. Okay. Take the case of transportation. Right. You know, you've lived on the East Coast for many years. You know, I used to live there too. Imagine on a rainy day trying to hail a cab in New York. Suddenly, all the taxi drivers are gone. Like, no one stops, and you're out there soaking. Now what do you do? You whip out your phone and voila, a car comes in and it's usually less expensive than your yellow cab. Taking on that transportation business worldwide, like we are the largest investors in ride-sharing apps in the world. That's a big deal. Yeah. That's not a technology-first business, although it's amazing how much technology actually goes in right. to figuring out the right scheduling, making sure all the drivers go to places where there will be demand, forecasting that demand, etc. But that's an example of businesses that take up a wide swath of GDP that use technology in very meaningful ways. There's so much we could exactly. dig into, which we won't. But uh, your own, anything, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll just give it to you to <laughs> take the conversation back to where you would like to see it go if you want. I mean, uh, but uh, let's go stick to this Europe thing for a little longer. I mean, do you feel in your community there is concern or is there just self-satisfaction because, hey, people are making money, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I would say you think about, you know, Arm is an interesting example, a great European fundamental tech company, but that's a long, long time ago. Uh, Skype, another one, you know, pretty long time ago, but clearly a transformative company. Nokia. Uh, Nokia, well, for that matter, Ericsson, but that was 150 years ago or something. <laughs> but, uh, and then, and then, uh, you know, uh, what, there was another one I was but about to mention. More recently, DeepMind. DeepMind, okay, yeah. that's good. Very recent, yeah. it's good. Named after you, clearly. <laughs> uh, what were you going to say, Yaron? No, I, I, I agree, and I agree with what Deep said about the fact that you need to uh, mitigate the risks that are uh, uh, that are part of investing in basic technology by investing in business model startups. It, that's that's what we do as well. You know, we do it on a smaller scale, unfortunately, than SoftBank, but. Uh, but, but we also have a very balanced portfolio that has, on the one hand, basic innovation, and on the other one, has business model startups that return the fund or, or return capital in a shorter period of time. Well, I know when we were talking before, you were talking, saying that in Europe in particular, you worry that maybe the investment community is not sufficiently laying the groundwork even for the next generation of business model startups because they require some fundamental new technologies. On the other hand, Deep did list a number of key things that are in transition right now, which each one of which probably could be argued is a fundamental transformation. So of course, how do you think about it? Of course, but they're few and far between. If you look at the, at the uh, only really comprehensive or balanced ecosystem in the world in terms of innovation, which is the U.S. or, or, or more, uh, you know, more specifically around the Bay Area, uh, you have startups that are doing a massive amount of startups that are doing basic innovation. At the same time, you have a massive amount of startups that are doing business models and, and, and promoting business model innovation. Uh, that is far less prevalent in Europe. Yes, of course, there are European companies that are reinventing mobile phones or, v or reinventing AI, but these are very few and far between. How do, you, how do you think about the Cambridge and the Oxford ecosystem? So the Cambridge ecosystem is very, very interesting. We also have uh, several investments in that, in that Cambridge ecosystem, uh, most notably in a company called Graphcore, which is uh, you know, a transformative uh, edge computing uh, company. <clears throat> but this is a, a very small cluster of companies at the end of the day that is focused on semiconductors. Uh, I don't see the, the variety and massive amount of, of, of tech-driven startups that I see in Silicon Valley or that I see in Israel. Uh, Israel has other problems, right? Because it has almost no business model innovation. So it's, uh, it, it's, it, it has, you know, it's also not balanced, but, uh, but at least it, it has you know, more variety of innovation. Okay, we are distressingly short on time, but since you mentioned Cambridge, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about Improbable, because I know <laughs> sure, Improbable did come out of Cambridge, it has. all the founders, right? right. And it, it is an unbelievably ambitious company aiming to use kind of a gaming platform to transform a vast variety of aspects of society. I mean, the vision is, I mean, just quickly, do you see that as a sort of world-changing tech? It is, and it, it is in multiple ways. So while the first application is gaming, they are fundamentally changing the way compute happens today. 
Like those of you who you know studied computer science, like I did in the 90s, we used to talk about parallel processing and parallel computing as if that was like the holy grail. We've moved much beyond that, and taking advantage of today's cloud technologies, different components of AI and machine learning, and then being able to do bite-sized computing elsewhere, closer to the edge, closer to where the user is. That's what they do. Yeah. And some great examples of where they are being used are things like you know simulating what happens when let's say a power transformer blows out in a city, and what implications that has on traffic, on healthcare, on civilian life, on military life, on defense. Yeah. Those are all things that are possible because of the platform they're building. Yeah, and I know they're really kind of platformatized gaming, which is really pretty exciting. They really have. You two guys are way too smart to have only 20 minutes or less than whatever we had, 17 and a half minutes up here. <laughs> but thank you so much thank for you. all these great things you've said, and thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>